Welcome to Second Chance Points. I'm Dave Rudin, and we're ready for another good week of talking FCAC boys basketball. And let's just start off real quickly with an update on my usual uh, co-host, my co-host, uh, Mike Walsh, who underwent heart surgery on Monday. Everybody's been asking about him. And uh, it's Saturday afternoon. And I actually just got a text from his wife about an hour ago. He's doing well. Uh He's got one one tube left in him, but uh, he doesn't doesn't have too much pain anymore, which was his big problem. And uh, for those of us who had two days before he watched his his first stream of a game, we were off a little bit. Uh, it wasn't until last night he streamed the game, and uh, he I guess because he didn't have to do the podcast, he actually watched the Notre Dame of Fairfield game. Uh, little connection there because the, the coach there was his former assistant and then he became a, an assistant of at the end at Trinity Catholic. So we're happy, happy to, to hear that Mike's doing so well, Mike, if you're, you're listening, uh, I miss you, but I guess uh, every good team is a really, really, really good six man. And uh, I'm really lucky to, to have as, as good a possible fill in as possible. And that's uh, the former Staples coach, Colin Devine. Colin, it's great seeing you. Uh, been missing you on the sideline, but I've seen you a lot. And uh, thanks for doing that. You, I, I know you and I go back a long way, and, and I know you and Mike uh, are, are have always been real close. And uh, two coaches who always talk during the season. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. It's an honor to fill in for my good friend and Hall of Famer, Coach Walsh, and it's great to hear he's doing so well. Yeah, we're all happy to ha to have that. So, uh, you know, first of all. Uh, how you doing? Is is it been? Uh, I I know you you've been in a lot of Staples games. I know you were last night at Trumbull Wilton, which is definitely a game we're we're going to talk about soon. But what's it been like not coaching? Is, has it been harder or easier than you um, thought? It would be? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's a little harder than I thought it would be, but uh, I'm still involved, uh, helping out the best that I can. I think I've seen you know probably ninety percent of the Staples games so far uh, on the road and at home. Uh, I've watched a lot of film. I think I've seen every team play in person or on film besides the Norwalk schools in St. Joe's. So I'm staying busy. You still watch film of games? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You, 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 uh, you're a special scout for Dave or? Uh, uh, just, no, I, I, answer, doing I answer as many questions as I can, but he's doing a great job. He's got a great staff with Bob Buswell and, and Chris Pickens and Jake Sullivan and a great, great he's group. Not, he's, he's, done, he's done a great job. Uh, yeah, I'm excited for him and the program, and I couldn't be happier for, for him, his staff, and the, and the entire Staples basketball community. So it's in a really good place. And Staples is going to be a, a starting point. Uh Actually, I just wanted uh, to mention bef before we get in a, a game I was at last night, which kind of stood out to me for, for two reasons. And, and that was the New Canaan uh, Fairfield Ward game, which I got about 10 text messages on after people saw the final score to make sure it wasn't a misprint. But uh, it, it was uh, Fairfield Ward beating New Canaan 36 to 28. And one of the lowest scoring games I, I can remember, it was actually four to three after one quarter. And, uh, and the two teams combined to miss 18 of 21 shots. But the one thing that, that I want to point out for those who didn't see the game, and I, I, I think it was a, a combination of two really tired teams and, and, and Colin, you probably, well, you do know what it's like uh, on midterm week that, uh, those Fridays after kids have had midterms, uh, everything's out of whack with schedules and you got a bunch of tired players. Yeah, I think that's a huge part of uh, the low scoring game. And, you know, you got two really good teams, two really good coaches, and they're exceptional coaches on the defensive side of the basketball. So they're going to miss shots. And, you know, Ryan, I talked to Ryan earlier today. He's coaching his son at the Parsons Center in Milford. And he's like, we won. I don't care if we scored 14 points. We, we won. And I'm and Danny's probably the same way. If, if Danny won 14-12, you know, find a way to win the game. And both coaches are great. they got great programs. And they're going to learn from it and, and move on. And, and that's that. And one thing that stood out, though, you, you look at that score and you you want to kill both teams offensively. But it was really a night, too, where you really needed to praise the teams defensively. But it, it was one of the best defensive games I, I've seen by two teams. As much as the offenses struggled and they did miss some open shots, uh, there were very few uncontested shots, too. Two really good defensive teams that know each other. So uh, 
you know, that, that was because I was there kind of stood out. And the other thing, and this was kind of cool to me more so because what it means about high school basketball in this area, I was at the game. I sat with, uh, with Chris Russo, who has been a friend for 25 to 30 years or so. We, we both grew up with, uh, I, we both have a mutual friend who introduced us a long time ago. And then Dave check. It's the former, uh, uh, president of the Knicks and, and Madison Square Garden, who I met earlier in the week. Uh, I sat with the two of them. And obviously, besides uh, being cool, listening to uh, you know, talking basketball with them, you know, th these are two two guys who have no ties to, to the program right now, other than both their sons at, uh, at different points, both played on the team. And, and here they are, uh, e even though, you know, no reason other than that, they, on a Friday night, they both drove to Fairfield to to watch the game. And I know they they still follow the team. They're close with Danny, but uh, uh, Colin, I I just thought that was cool, really, because what it means about the interest in, in high school basketball. Yeah, you know, I, I think that speaks to the excitement and, and enthusiasm around FCAC basketball. You know, for for a variety of reasons, Coach K is not going to Tree Catholic to recruit players. But I think the, the excitement and enthusiasm about FCAC basketball is at an all-time high. You look at the student sections, the fan attendance coming out of COVID, and you got hardworking players, hardworking coaches, and the, to see all the community support and the, and the student section support their teams is just a great experience, basketball experience overall. Yeah, I mean, it also speaks to the job uh, Danny Melzer's done in bringing up uh, basketball to a school that uh, for a long time you didn't associate with basketball and, and talking about the fans. I mean, Colin, you've seen it uh, the last few years at Staples where you used to have maybe 15 or 20 kids at games. And now, uh, now the student sections standing room only. Yeah. You know, I, I think the, obviously the old <laughs> adage is uh, who you play when you play them and where um, I think the neutral court in the FCAC playoffs will, will help balance that out. But, you know, the student sections have been great and they really are like the sixth man uh, on the court and they're really supporting the the athletes. And it's a lot of fun to see. Well, I thought just for kind of the, the meat and potatoes of this podcast with having uh, you on, we talk uh, because they're, they're newsworthy right now about the, the two programs that you have the, the strongest ties with and yeah. that's uh, Staples as former coach and Trumbull as former player and, and where uh, I know you're still close with uh, the staff there and, and they were both newsworthy. Um, they actually went and combined 0 and 4. I didn't really think about that this week, but uh, you know, first of all, with Staples, uh, they came into the week undefeated. And even though they had two losses to, uh, to Danbury and to Stanford, uh, two good teams this is this is a a team that is really capable of making a run for an FCAC title and taking the program where where you built it up to and possibly making uh taking it to the next step you've seen a lot of the games what what have been your impressions yeah I was I was up at the at the Danbury game and you got to give uh Danbury players and coaches they played a really really tough game and uh, Staples had a lead and um, in the fourth quarter, a little bit of momentum shift. And, um, you know, I think the Danbury game was a game that Staples is, is, is going to learn from. I didn't see the game last night, but I know coach and the, the senior leaders and Zajac and Honig and Rothenberg and, and Sale, they're going to write the ship and they're going to have a, a tremendous season, a t tremendous season. I think that um, they're going to come together as a team and, and just learn from this week. You know, I, I didn't see the game last night, but you know, when you're playing a top team like Danbury, it's going to come down to the fundamentals and just a couple of blockouts and some free throws and communication. So there's no doubt in my mind that they still can't uh, contend and, and win an FCA championship. Yeah, I, I I agree with you 100. percent. I, I some, somebody texted me and just told me, uh, which is interesting, that Stanford played played a, a zone defense against Staples, which isn't the kind of defense I I think they're going to see too often. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe I, I, maybe maybe after last night, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be a little bit of copycat uh, defense against Zajac, and you know, um, I think Zajac's the most uh, valuable player and the player of the year in the FCAC, not because I coached him, just because what he does on both both sides of the basketball and what the other coach has to do to prepare and practice 
to stop him, you know? So I think that that plays a part into why he's so integral into Staples success uh, and ultimately winning a championship. I'd have to say right now, the best guard in the league would be Jalen, Jalen Brown uh, <laughs> from, from Norwalk. He scored 54 points. And uh, if my memory serves me correctly, the last FCAC player to score 50 points was Kazmir against Greenwich. And no disrespect to Coach Brennan and Greenwich, but they were playing a box in one and he still, still scored 51 points. Um, that's so, pretty good. You did your homework there. I didn't that's know. just, that's all, from, that's all from memory. I didn't get too far. Growing up uh, watching Rochelle Jones and Anthony Harris being a player and, and coaching in the league, you know, so. I don't remember the last fifty, the last uh, fifty point game. I, I do, I do. Pretty sure was, Joe, I'm pretty sure it's Casimir and, and Coach Coach Walsh will will correct us if we're wrong. He would, he would know right away. I, uh, you know, I should have visited the um, hospital room. Really. I, I would like to talk a little bit about Danbury. And Casey Box been been doing this a long time. I think he's a year older than me. You know, like like Casey, John Daly, Danny, myself, Roy. I'm probably missing somebody. We grew up in the league, played in the league, and, and Casey does a, a tremendous job. And he's got the. Uh, I believe it's Perkins cousins. Uh, if I mispronounce anyone's name, I apologize. I'm out of the game a little bit. And uh, those three played really, really well together uh, up at Danbury last week. And I think that, you know, mm-hmm. the team that develops like role players, so, like you think of Brendan O'Hara at Ward or Caleb Smith or Ethan Cookie or Staples and gets those guys getting quality minutes um, off the bench or even just uh, a few points, a few rebounds, because all those kids are playing great defense already. I think the team that develops the secondary players uh, to make more impact is probably going to be the champion because every coach does a great job scouting preparation and they do a really good job of taking away the team's first and second, second options. So the third and fourth options that step up, I think is going to be a key for the champion. I, and you look at what Danbury did Tuesday night and they go from a, a 10 point deficit to a nine point win. Uh, but t- to me, Nobody, the, the, the talent level there, there's a little, little bit of a step down. There's a lot of competitiveness, but the, 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 the guy was, I'm really, was, I got to correct you. That was, yeah, it, it, that's a swing, but it really was a two possession game. You know what I mean? So, it, you know, I heard there were a lot of missed one and ones, yeah, yeah, one and so one and ones too, that also made a, a big difference yeah. in the game. But if you look, if you look at the league, I mean, we can argue, but you think of Danbury, Staples, Ridgefield, and then at three and a half, you got New Canaan. Wilton, Ward, St. Joe's, um, you know. Stanford after last Stanford night. Stanford after last them, night, man. you know, and I think that, you know, whoever plays well down the stretch and develops their bench and, and, and is the most fundamental is, is, is going to um, reap those benefits. And this might be the year, and I think my memory served me correctly, uh, the last time an eight beat a one was Coach Walsh was at Trinity and they beat St. Joe's. And this, Joe's this, might, this might be the year at Ward that the eight beats the one, you, you know, so. I, I was texting last night. I, I Again, we we're getting way, way, way ahead of ourselves. But I, I said if Danbury were the one seed, they'd be more susceptible to getting beat in the first round than, than they would be, I think, in, in the semifinals or the final if they, if they made it that far. But uh, we got a long way to go there. I'll tell you, Christian Jeffers is, is, is the player whose stock has risen the most in my book after seeing him last Thursday against Stanford and seeing what he did the last uh, two games. Uh, I'll tell you what, he's making a run as being a possible player of the year candidate right now. He's been outstanding. 100%. He, he's a tough cover. He's got a motor. He was playing really well on both sides of the ball when I saw him up at Danbury. Uh, he had a really, really big third quarter. Um, I, I can't, can't argue with that. I think he's a player of the year candidate as well. Okay, uh, this is something else I, I said to to a coach. You tell me, am am I right or wrong here? You you uh, I, honest answer. Uh, yeah, okay. honest answer. I I said if if Staples goes on and, and wins a title, gets the championship game, they're going to look at this week as, as a turning point. A because of the you you can't uh, you know. I, I know they had the lead, but there's no shame going to Denver and losing. But I think they probably learned even more last night by losing to Stanford in that you got to stay tough every night. And and I know they had a lot of uh, emotion put into the game on, on Tuesday against Danbury. And uh, I, I don't know if, if, you know, from, from a psychological standpoint, uh, if they're in, in a different place, but I think they probably learned a lot about from from last night's loss, maybe even more so than from the Danbury loss. 
No, I, I agree with that 100%. You know, and I, like I said earlier, I, I believe in Dave and his staff and his senior leadership to uh, write the ship. And there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to learn from this. And, you know, you got to credit Dave, his staff and his players for the, the great start. You know, was it the, the toughest schedule? No, but they're still beating some double L schools and some, some good teams, well coached. And, you, you know, you, sometimes you learn a lot more from a loss than, than, than the win. So I, I, I agree 100%. Yeah, and, and in my eyes, Staples stock hasn't hasn't dropped uh, based on anything this week. We'll we'll see what happens going forward and how they come out of it. Uh, the other team, and and Mike and I have really not spoken about them, and they're on the periphery right now, and they they're looking still for a quality win. But Trumbull is is a team. Again, I I. After games, I end up trying to write a story while eight, eight different coaches are texting with me. And uh, you know, one one coach told me last night Trumbull will be one of the one of the eight teams in the playoffs, and they've just been on the cusp. And, and you look at what happened to them this week. But Buddy Bray had to be snake bitten. You start off the week where I guess they they lost. Uh, I, I forget if it was an eight or nine point lead against uh, against Ridgefield. Uh, Sean Reset hits a shot to tie the game, a three point shot. I heard with like seven or eight seconds to go. And then a foul, which one coach then told me was a questionable foul watching the tape. And the other one told me, no, it was a good call. But regardless, uh, they hit a foul shot with, with 1.8 seconds to go or something like that. And uh, Ridgefield, come, you know, wins by a point. And obviously, that's that's a heartbreaking loss for Trumbull to play that well, that well and, and lose to, uh, you know, the, the power in the league, the last five, yeah. six years. No, I, I think their schedule is not as tough, but similar to New Canaan, what Danny, his players have done, you know, two overtime games, three overtime games, and they're right in the ship. Now I think Trumbull has Ludlow and Norwalk next week. And if they go two and over one and one, I think they're right back in the hunt for being in the top eight. You know, he's got uh Coach Bray has been doing it forever. Obviously, he's a mentor of mine, and I got into coaching and teaching because of him. And he's done a great job for 30-something years, not only just X and O-wise, but how he cares about the kids and uh, their families. And he just he knows how to motivate his team, and I think that he'll get them ready to go this week. And then you, you come back last night, and uh, I they had a double-digit lead against Wilton, and the Warriors are have one of the best home court advantages in the league. And they rally. And then a, a sophomore who hasn't gotten a lot of playing time left yet, Ryan Luchetta, hits a three-point shot at the buzzer. And uh, Buddy's got to be coming away saying, what do I have to do to beat one of these uh, yeah. these contenders? He could have easily been been 2-0 and this week. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, the home court advantage for Wilton is probably an understatement. Right. Regardless if the semifinals and finals are there and Wilton's in it. I mean, it's a tough, tough place to play just with the field house, the floor, uh, especially with the the Warrior fans and a really good high school basketball game uh, back and forth. Trumbull did um, give up the lead, I think, in the middle of the third. And Lucetta did a really good job getting tough twos. And I thought Trumbull's defense was very, very good. And he made some, you know, really tough left-handed layups. And then he made that big shot. So he, he's kind of like that type of player that I was talking about. He had 15 points last night. And Coach Bray and his defensive assistant, Matt Landon, uh, do a really good job on defense. And they, they did a pretty good job shutting down McTiernan. Uh, if I mispronounce his name, I, I apologize. He hit one three on America's play on out-of-bounds play. And then he had 12 free throws. So Lucetta really stepped up in that that secondary role I was talking about that the team, the championship team needs to develop to win this thing. Now, looking at the box scores, Walton's been getting double digit points. They have double digit points from about six or seven different players. So they seem, uh, Joel seems like he's setting himself up for uh, a strong second half run. He's, I mean, he's already had a strong first half run there. They're eight and two right now. Uh, yeah, what what what's your impression, Trumbull? Play they're, they're, they they definitely seem like they're going to be in this for for the long run. I know Luca Antonio, uh, the football player, has been playing really well for them. Uh, Sean Reset, who who's one of their outstanding soccer players, uh, is off to a to a good start. Uh, they 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 look like a team that uh, you know is is going to battle right down to the last week for a playoff spot. Yeah, uh, Antonio is a really, really good basketball player. Reset's having a really, really good year as a leader um, and a scorer. 
but I was really, really impressed by their defense. They have a, this kid, Elmo, I believe is his last I name. Elmo, um, yeah. Ryan Johnston comes off the bench as a sophomore, hits two big threes. Uh, they got a guard, I believe his name's Fowler, who just kind of gets them into their stuff, is really unselfish. And their toughness on defense, if they can get quality baskets um, and finishes down the stretch, I think they're going to win those games like Wilton last night. I, I don't think it was a defensive thing last night. I think they couldn't just get a basket when they needed it, and it's tough on the road. But I think if they can figure that out, which I, which I know they will, I think they're a top eight team. You're going to be a little bit biased on, on, on this one, but uh, I, I think everybody, yeah, I, I think Buddy Bray is, one, is an underrated coach. He's been there a long time, and he hasn't been there a long time uh, just to be there a long time. Uh, he's his team's his team's never underachieved. He's never he's never had a, a, a championship caliber team that ended up uh, finishing at 500. And if anything else, I, I mean, he gets the most out of his players. And uh, he's had many, many instances where, where his teams have overachieved. I I don't think he gets we talk so much about the young guns because there's so many good young coaches in the league. But uh, he's he's right now the dean of. Uh, of FCI coaches. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think he gets the the credit he deserves. That might be so, but not, not for me. He's a great coach and, and, you know, he's a hall of famer. He's going to the hall of fame this, this week or this, this June, but more importantly, he's a hall of fame person and what he does for the, the Trumbull community and the basketball program. I mean, he coached three sports for 25 years and works as site director and, and he's an old school uh, education based athletics uh, mentor and he cares about all the right things um, and he's a great X and O coach and uh, you know he was scouting you know 25 years ago watching film at three o'clock in the morning like all the young guys are doing now so he's been he's been keeping the same hours for a very very long time and uh, he does a really good job uh, he was a good player obviously for Trumbull High School as well uh, but he's got a really good feel for the game so I think his adjustments uh, even last night, trying to get a quick basket, a basket, they posted up or set. So his feel for the game, I think, really, really um, is an advantage for him down the stretch. So they're, def they're definitely uh, in it for the long haul team. Another thing that uh, I kind of looked up last night after after getting everything done is this. I, I think one reason there's been so much excitement is the competitiveness in the league right now. I mean, we're getting very few blowouts. Uh, if my numbers in quick research are right, there have been 10 overtime games so far this year. And uh, in, in one 11-day stretch, there there were eight. Uh, New Canaan played four in a row, and Ludlow played three in a row. And I think two-thirds of the league has played at least uh, one overtime game and again, that that gets uh, back to having twelve teams that are that are three and two, two and three, or or in Stanford's case, three and three. Uh, every you know, all all there. I, I I think you know certain teams are you know Danbury's played a lot of close games, but they're winning them because of their talent. Uh, do you remember the the league being as competitive this early in the year as it's been so far? I don't think so. I really don't. And I think, you know, those overtime games are obviously, obviously a one or two possession basketball game and the coaches and players that can learn the most from those games and get more experience and improve, you know, when the sophomores become juniors and the players are great in the role and they get more responsibility are going to find ways to win those games down the stretch. And I think that really comes down to just what we talked about earlier, the excitement about FCX basketball, the commitment by the players, the coaches, the parents, you know, to be a good basketball player, you're playing basketball 12 months. And I think we're seeing those dividends with all those close games. And the other thing too, I, the, the FCX doing well in non-league games right now, because I'm just counting up right now, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 teams have, have winning record. 12 teams have winning records as well. So the FSAC fared very well in the, in the non-league portion of their schedule as well. We, you know, talk about how the FSAC is going to do against the rest of the state, but we've, we've pretty much had, had two FCAC. Well, Ridgefield and Danbury have been in the top 10 Danbury the whole time, Ridgefield yeah. most of the time. And, uh, you know, Staples was, was on the, the periphery, I, th I think they got up as, as high as 12th at one point. So the the league is as a whole is is standing up really well this year. Yeah, I mean, at Bridgefield beat St. Bernard's by 30. They beat Notre Dame at Fairfield by 12 at Notre Dame. 
I'm not, I mean, Wilton had a good out non-conference win, I believe. Danbury had obviously undefeated. Um, but that's really interesting because, you know, we have a lot of great coaches and a lot of good player, great co- great players, but it's the contrasting styles of all these top 10 teams and how they win, you know. But I think the common theme is the coaching, how hard the kids play, and every one of those teams plays really good defense. So I think as we come down the stretch that it's going to come down to the coaches making adjustments, players playing into new roles, and, and matchups. So if, if you have a defensive matchup that you can take advantage of, I think those things are going to be uh, really key. I think the coaches realize the the talent level is, has gone down a little bit in the league in terms of really having, you know, good scorers, great shooters. And you can teach a, a kid to, to be a good shooter, but you can teach them to play good defense if they're willing to work at it. And I think that's... Uh, I, I think that's been a, a storyline the last few years is how many teams have, have won with defense. Uh, and case in point, the Ward New Canaan game last night. Yeah, because uh, New Canaan or Ward held number five. I'm, I'm blanking on his name. I think it's uh, Laddich. For uh, he came in to Staples uh, from New yeah. Canaan and hit like five threes. And then I think Swaller and his defense. I think O'Hare held him to, to zero points. Um, and then um, Plesser who shut all, down Bram. They shut down Bramwood too. And they shut and, down Bramwood too. But I think um, and Plesser is averaging, you know, probably twenty five points per game, and they held Ward to thirty six as a team. So I think that goes to the toughness and the um, up, up in the coaching and the defensive side of the ball. I will argue though. I think the skill level of shooting the basketball and, and moving the ball has, has has increased. I think that more teams are playing like Ridgefield, Wilton, Staples, New Canaan, and the ball's moving quite a bit. And they're, um, they're getting high percentage shots. And I, I think Staples made eight threes and lost last night. Um, and I think St. Joe's has some young guards that are scoring the ball. So it, is it the same SEAC that we remember? But I think it's, it's, it's getting there and it's just a little bit different. But I, I really am impressed by the skill level and the hard work the kids are putting in. You actually can answer this as well as anybody. It's a little bit different this year. But in the past, a lot of your most recent teams have had a lot of football players on it. I know, uh, and football being their primary sport as well, I know a bunch of coaches have said to me, one thing that's been really hard is you get these football players who are key players on the team, but they're really only playing basketball. You only have them for two to three months. They're they're playing seven on seven in the off season. Uh, has that made it a lot more difficult as a, as a coach where you have good players you're dependent on, but you only have them for a really short period of time? You know, as an educator and a coach, I want as many athletes playing as many sports as you possibly can. So if they're going to show up and, and be available to compete and, and get better and help the team, I'm, I'm taking them. I know Danny's the same way and Swaller and, and Coach Bray's the same way. Um but, you know, there's a lot of pressure on kids at a young age to, to specialize. So any kid that wants to compete and show up and play basketball and can help the team, I think all of us as coaches are, are taking them and, and, and welcoming them to help the team win. No, no I, I wasn't. I, I love it, too. I love the two and three sport athletes. I hope I, I just wish it was it was mandatory. Uh, it's, not or, a bad, or, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. Not, you know, yeah. if you want or you know what, I'm not going to fault the kid who really, really only loves one sport. Uh, I mean, there are some people who only play one sport maybe because they're pressured into it. And uh, well, the other thing, not to interrupt you, the other thing is sometimes those sports choose people, you know, I'm, I'm six, six and wasn't a good athlete. I was somewhat skilled, but you know, my strike zone was too big. So baseball was over for me and I couldn't pitch. So like sometimes sports choose different kids and that's why they specialize in, in, um, in one sport too. So, yeah. But so, I, and like I said, you needed those football players and you wanted them. It's just kind of hard. It, it puts you in a harder position than, than maybe some, you know, coaches in other sports when you only have these kids for such a short period of time. No, no, you're right. And and it's really, really hard. You got to be a, a, a great athlete. And I think Jake thought, and, and I had for Shanti years ago, did a really, really good job just taking their helmet off and playing great point guard. You know, I had a Harris uh, at Greenwich way back in the day and Daryl Parler for Coach Bray and Trumbull. But, you know, uh, my best friend, Mike Buswell, played three sports and, and those kids are they're not around a whole lot anymore. Um, it's not easy to go from football and you're playing to the middle of December and then you haven't picked up a ball since August to be an impact player. But the kids that do that, that's really impressive. Uh why don't we bounce around since since I've got you here today? I hadn't really thought about this until right now, but let me just ask you a couple of 
couple of sort of insider questions in terms of uh, what you thought as a coach, and because you, you're only you know you're you haven't been removed since the season, but you know we talk about the the toughest player places to play. Which which school did you? Which school did what did you find the toughest to play in? Uh, I would go with Danbury one, and then a tie with Ridgefield in Wilton. Uh, it's number two. Um, New bus Canaan, rides, bus rides, uh, student section. You know, well coached teams. It's 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 a hike up there on the bus ride. And I think New Canaan is a really really tough place to play just because of the positioning of the court. You know, um, and their student section is great too. Um, but you know, you go to Trumbull or West Hill with a 94 foot court on the road and, and they're tough to play, you know? So, but I would say definitely Richfield, Wilton and, and Danbury are the top three. Was there any, any road, road gym where you just hop in a, have a lot of success, uh, and, Central. And, and, <laughs> Bridgeport Central and coach McLeod. And that was, uh, that was a lot of fun for us to go up there, um, and, and compete with those guys. Um, but, you know, in Trinity Catholic way back in the day was was really, really tough place to play, regardless of the talent. You know, it was a tough place to, to win, for sure. Yeah, that little band box there. Uh, what, uh, what what do you consider? What do you, do, Staple, do you consider Staples to have a main rival? I, you've got rivalries with different schools, but you the school doesn't have a natural rival, really. I think there are some different ones in different sports. Yeah, uh, you know Staples, Darien, and field hockey, just because of of where where they've been, and and the baseball team probably, uh, and soccer teams have had some rivals. So I don't know from a basketball standpoint, was was there one school or or two schools that you considered your biggest rival? Um, no, I think you know being from Trumbull and and, and not and put, competing against St. Joe's, you know, as as a Trumbull person uh, working in Westport, I always felt. Like, you know, St. Joe's was a rival, but for the kids, probably it'd be Greenwich uh, because of the football Thanksgiving Day uh, tradition, you know, but I'm, I'm a competitor. The kids are competitors. I treat every, every team we play as, as a rival, you know what I mean? But, you know, anytime we, we, we do play Wilton quite a bit and it's been back and forth the last six years and they're, you know, adjoining towns. And I think that's a little bit of a rivalry for Staples basketball. Has, has the Staples Greenwich rivalry extended into other sports? I mean, there was a huge crowd um, when Staples basketball. I heard, I heard, I heard it was like close to to Feld for that game. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And you know, the Greenwich is is yelling, "Where's your ring?" And Staples, <laughs> how was how was your turkey? You know, so I, I think there's a little bit of uh, a rivalry there because of uh, because of football. And then obviously lacrosse and Coach Kishansky did a great job beating Darian finally. And so I think the Darian Staples lacrosse is a rival. You know, I think back in the day when Fairfield High was one school, I think that was kind of a Staples thing because they're next door. It's got to be a lot of fun being up there. You look at across the board with male sports at Staples. I, I don't remember uh, such concurrent success with so many different teams right now. Uh, you look like now, now basketball add to the list competing for a title. You had, the, as you mentioned, the, the lacrosse team. Uh, winning a cha its first championship last year. You yeah, got the football team that that has been on the cusp right now. Baseball you know, team has won championships. I think that's really just where you know the outgoing athletic director Marty Lisovic did a really really good job. We have committed coaches, players, and parents, and I think it's really it's a partnership between all three of those people. You know, the athletes, the parents, the coaches, the community. And I, I got to give a lot of credit to our youth programs. So the head coaches all here do a great job connecting with the youth. And I think that's paid dividends for Staples Athletics. And it's really fun to see. Ever see yourself coming back to coach at any point or? Uh... Well, I, uh, my daughter is in my office. I was just, I saw the, the arm sticking out and. Uh... I, uh, oh, Sorry. yeah, that's all right. Uh, old, old habits die hard. So I'm in my office on a Saturday. And I'm um, coaching my twin daughters in fourth grade uh, travel basketball, and they, they play more games than the Knicks. So I'm, I'm busy. Um, no, I think I'm ready for my next challenge. I, I don't think high school coaching is um, is my next move, but uh, I'm still involved. I love the game. I, and like I said, it's, it's been really, really cool to go into these gyms and see the excitement around FCF basketball. 
So. Most importantly, for those uh, who've been listening to the podcast the last two years, you haven't been teed up yet this year, have you? No, but after Staples losing twice, Trumbull losing twice, UConn losing twice, I thought, you know, maybe getting thrown out of a fourth grade game tomorrow. <laughs> would be but no, I have uh, no technicals this year. My daughters are doing well. They've got a good group of girls. It's, it's been a lot of fun. And I run into so many coaches, Ryan Swaller, um, Tom Keys, uh, Swaller's brother, all at the Parsons Center coaching their sons and daughters. So it's it's been really cool. Well, I know uh, we we miss you on the sideline. Staples uh, misses you on the sideline, though, though uh, we see the strength of your staff from last year with what's uh, carried over this year and, and with Dave picking things up. But uh, Staples' loss is, is the Rudin Report uh, second, chance pod, second Chance Points podcast gain. So, Kanye, this, this, this was great. It, it's great to get an, another coach's insight and talk about things that, that I'm not able to. So uh, uh, based on your performance today, you're, you're hired. We want awesome. you. Thank, thanks Mike. for having me on. I yeah, appreciate well, it. We'll, we'll have to talk. We'll have to talk to Mike. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe this podcast, uh, we, we become a, a trio. Uh, yeah, we could, we could divvy up the work. You know, you could take Stanford below Westport, you know, I'll take the middle and then, you know, so It'll all work out, but I, re I really appreciate you having me on and thank you for all you do for the SCI yeah, covering sports. It's, it's great. And uh, what you and Mike do is a lot of fun. And, and uh, I know a lot of us look forward to listening to it every Monday. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. This podcast is a lot of fun. And uh, I know uh, after everybody listens to listens to this one, they're, they're going to have the same thing about you. You've, uh, you've definitely added to it. So Colin, thanks a lot for joining me this week. Uh, that's uh, Second Chance Points. I want to thank uh, Cooper Boardman. Uh, does a great job on the sound editing. We got a lot of uh, a lot of big games this week, so uh, we we're never at a loss the way the league's going for conversation. Have a good week, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Dave.